Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, day two of the July meeting of the Penal Code Committee, Penal, the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code. I'm just going to give a couple more seconds so the public uh, waiting room can populate, and then we'll get started. Thank you for coming. All right, um, again, thank you all for coming and welcome back to the second uh, half of our uh, July meeting. Uh, today's agenda is as follows. First, um, Tom is gonna give a staff update about uh, what uh, they're up to and been researching and developments on that end. Uh, then we'll have a discussion of yesterday's uh, presentations. Um, and the goal for that is really to have um, to sort of narrow down some thinking and recommendations for further research, focus, and development for committee staff. We're not making any um, uh, formal recommendations at this point. And then we'll have public comment after that. Um, we'll also have staff, Tom and Laura here to help answer questions because we might get into some substantive stuff and they were so helpful with their memo. Before we get started, do we have any housekeeping to discuss? All right. Good. All right. Uh, sending it over to Tom. Great. Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, housekeeping wise, my, uh, maybe we could approve the minutes of the, of the May meeting. That might be a good first thing to do. Oh, that's a good thing. Uh, so I move to adopt uh, the meetings, for, the minutes from our last meeting. Second. Thanks. Uh, anyone, all in, anyone opposed? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. So they're unanimously uh, approved. Thank you, Tom. Great. And just the uh, first thing I wanted to cover was an update on the substance discussed at that meeting, which covered extreme sentences, life without parole, three strikes, things like that. Uh, the staff, we are continuing to research the topics and we're planning on having more concrete proposals for discussion uh, the next time the committee meets. And of course, we also had a little memo we prepared for this meeting of updates on where uh, research is right now and happy to answer any questions about that if anybody has any. Um, but I think the discussion for that will mostly be at the next uh, next time we're together. And then a few data updates. I just wanted to update everyone on uh, the progress that we're continuing to make on, on getting data together. Uh, first, we recently received data from the California Department of Justice that we had been after uh, for quite a long time and it was great to get it. And we're very, very grateful to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice for helping us out with that. And we look forward to diving into it. And of course, as with all the committee's data work, we're following the strictest security and privacy protocols that we can, because we know how important that is. And the last data update is tomorrow, we have a research associate dedicated to the committee's work starting at the California Policy Lab. So they're starting tomorrow. And as you all remember, the Policy Lab is our research partner and they're based out of UC Berkeley. And that's how we're able to work with uh, Steve Raphael, Mia Bird, and, and some of their colleagues there. So I'm excited to have all those pieces coming together. Legislative update, uh, not much has changed since uh, I spoke to you all in May about this, but we have seven committee uh, related pieces of legislation that are going through the process and we're monitoring that and offering whatever assistance we can wherever we can. And um, that's moving along. So we've got seven bills from our report last year that are related to some of those recommendations. The death penalty report, we're also putting, putting finishing touches on that and we're gonna hand it off to a copy editor and designer very soon. We're looking at publication date in August right now on the death penalty report that was approved last meeting. And then last thing is, as I've said a few times and it's still true, we are gonna hire more attorneys soon. So if anyone particularly in the audience is interested in, in working with the committee, please keep an eye on our webpage or get in touch with anybody on staff and we'll uh, let you know where we are. So that's the updates for me, Mike, and unless anybody has any questions, that's all I've got. Any questions for Tom? Uh, nope. All right, on the last point, uh, I really do wanna emphasize if anybody again in the audience or uh, in the committee has um, any potential candidates for people that we might wanna hire, that'd be great. We're really looking for top-notch attorneys to help uh, add to our team. Um, all right, with that said, I'm gonna to switch to conversation about yesterday's meeting. And I think this will be the bulk of today's uh, gathering. Uh, again, the point uh, of this part of our conversation is not to come to any consensus or recommendations on policy proposals, but instead to 
Um, I want to lift up the topics that seemed to gather the most amount of attention of our conversation yesterday. Um, and the goal ultimately is to direct um, staff for further research and focus on those various areas that we might have interested. So that's sort of our goals. And I'm gonna basically, the idea is I'm gonna go walk through the panels um, and try to touch the pieces that I think seemed to uh, get the most attention from the committee members. Um, Senator Skinner and Assembly Member Lee, I appreciate that you were not able to join us yesterday or were in and out. So uh, I'll give a brief summary of each. And then I'm really like to open the floor and see um, how, what people think about those ideas, whether or not there's things that we should pursue further. And then of course, before moving on to the next panel, I just wanna, if in case I missed anything and there were particular topics that anybody on this committee uh, was interested in further development, whether they actually came up at the meeting itself with the witnesses, or if it was from the memo or just a related topic. So please chime in. So our, our first panel, um, I think the first, I'm just gonna go in uh, order of the notes that I took, but the first uh, topic of conversation that seemed to generate the most conversation was around parole and the parole standard and increasing the number of people um, who received parole and to clarify the parole standards. Uh, this is something that's been extraordinarily important to me. I know Senator Skinner, it's been on your agenda for quite some time. And of course it was also on the committee's agenda last year. Um, and we made a, you know, a, a pretty robust, I think, recommendation on how to improve the parole standard and a, a pretty strong case that the current parole standard is kind of in the heartland of what this committee's business is about and that it's confused, conflicted, the statutes are not clear, the case law is unclear. Unfortunately, of, of our 10 recommendations, really only two were completely left untouched by the legislature and almost fell like dead balloons. So I'm not sure how much we wanna get into this right now. I think we should have a conversation later about whether or not to revive, um, amend or drop our old recommendation. But because we did talk about it a bit yesterday, I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave it uh, unsaid. Uh, does anybody have anybody anything to say about this? Yes, Senator Skinner. You're on mute. I'm curious. Obviously, I wasn't able to hear the presentations, but the you know obviously we had a panel. Um, we had two panels on um, sentencing, right? Or three, really? But and the sentencing, I'm assuming though. Well, I maybe they touched on parole. We obviously also you heard from our executive director of the parole hearings, Jennifer Schaefer, but I wondered how much any of those panelists um, dealt with the parole aspect of the sentencing or whether they focused primarily on either, you know, whether they had indeterminate or determinant sentences and lengths of time and things like that, or whether they touched much on parole. Because if they didn't touch a whole lot on parole, then I think it might be worth it for us in the future you know, we, from my point of view, we only minimally touched sort of discussions on parole. We didn't hear really from that many other states, for example, what their practices are, what their, um, you know, what lessons learned and that kind of thing. And we may want to in the future, but I'm curious whether any of those panels touched on it much. So let me answer that briefly. Um, so we all, we sort of in some ways ran the gamut. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Justice Tony Klein, but obviously yeah. this is like you know, one of his top, top, you know, issues. And he was primarily concerned with life or parole hearings, traditional parole hearings. We also heard from uh, Jennifer Schaefer, who primarily talked about Prop 57 parole, which involves a different group of people. It's not lifers, but they apply a very similar parole standard. And I think some of the sim same problems exist in terms of the grant rates for the Prop 57. But again, it wasn't the lifer traditional parole. And then we did hear from a few other states about how parole is handled there, mainly in the context of indeterminate sentencing for again, so not for um, you know homicide lifers, but for people who get a sentence of five to 10 years. And how did the parole board work in that context? So it almost came up in, 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 in all of those ways, um, and I agree with you. Like we, this is this is a this is a big issue and a big problem. Well, and again, I'm falls in our heartland. That, I'm guessing that 
Judge Klein probably talked a lot about indeterminate sentencing because he feels very strongly about it, having had a big role in that. And of course, I, I don't, maybe we, maybe this was presented to us at one point, but my understanding is now the majority of people in California prison for three years or longer are all indeterminate sentence and not determinate. Yeah. So anyway. The, the answer to that is, um, is about 20, 25% of people are lifers with a full ordinary uh, homicide uh, indeterminate sentencing. And Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. And then there's another group that is Prop 57 eligible who have a determinate sentence, right? But Prop 57 gives you a parole chance before your enhancements kick in. So if you include that group, and that's a lot of second strikers, and then include some... Um, there's some the juvenile. There's a, some, a group of juvenile uh, cases that are, were not traditional lifers, and then elder parole. If you add all of those together, then you get to close to a majority of the prison population, and probably even more so today because of COVID and the and the limited number of intakes. But we're I think it's close to close to half have. I, I don't know if we want to go so far as to say ind indeterminate sentences because many of them have an end date, like are, a, but they have a parole, an opportunity for release by the parole board. Hmm. Maybe we put it that way. Okay. Um, Justice Marino. Yeah, I mean, I thought the presentations yesterday were were uh, excellent, uh, and it raised a lot of questions uh, in my mind. And I, I can tell you the things that things that I'm interested in for possibly uh, further further research. Uh, first of all, the two issues with respect to, I guess I'm talking about, you know, lifers. Uh, the two things that have always uh, concerned me for many years is, has been the factors that, you know, go into uh, the parole decision, whether to release or not. I think these are incorporated in, in, in regulations. And one, as I mentioned yesterday, were the circumstances of the offense, which, which are immutable. Uh, and it seems that at some point, uh, you know, some kind of consideration should be given to establishing, you know, some kind of uh, distance or aging uh, and, and what weight you give to that after a certain period of time, because all of these, generally all the, the life sentences involve, you know, pretty pretty uh, heinous crimes or certainly violent uh, crimes. So uh, I think some kind of exploration of that and seeing how that can be uh, mitigated. I think I heard one of the pre presenters yesterday say they don't even consider that. I'm not sure which one it was from one of the other states. Uh, that kind of was illuminating uh, to me. The second area of concern is, is for me has always been, uh, you know, the future dangerousness and the low level the low threshold level for which uh, that uh, is given, uh, I think it's any evidence <laughs> and the court will defer to the uh, parole board if there's you know, any evidence of future dangerousness. And with respect to that, and I think this came up uh, yesterday by a couple of the presenters, is you know, how, do you, how do you test for that? And you know, I'm not schooled in all the various ways that you know, social scientists can come up with that. But as I said yesterday, it almost sounds like science fiction when you're see something out of a, a born a movie, I think, you know. Minority you know, Report, yes. Yeah, it's like, okay, you're gonna do it. But the fact of the matter is, I, I'm a firm believer that people age out, you know, whether it's at 40 or 50, but certainly, certainly beyond 50. Uh, so I was impressed with, you know, some of the other, uh, percentages of people released on, on parole taken by other states. And we're not talking about other countries in Western Europe where the, the parole rates are even lower. So I think that really has got to be looked into. And one thing I thought about uh, this morning, I'm not sure it came up yesterday. I read something in the LA Times about uh, here in LA County, maybe even statewide, uh, placement into foster care. And there's just a huge amount of implicit bias that goes in into those decisions to remove a child from the home, put them in foster care. And as you would predict, you know, those removals 
and place them in the foster care heavily skewed against uh, people of color. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think uh, Professor Olson kind of referred to this yesterday in, in talking about you know the al algorithms that may be used if there's implicit bias. But I, I would really be interested to see if any kinds of studies have been done uh, on parole release uh, and if there is implicit bias, and, and you know, a lot of state agencies now have that kind of built into their, their training. Uh, but I would be interested in knowing whether or not, you know, some of the, I forget what they're called, uh, deputy commissioners, other people in the, in the decision-making process uh, have received that kind of training, but at least statistically, there must be a way of exploring whether or not uh, people of color are not getting a fair shot due to implicit uh, bias. And then the final thing I would say, and, and I think uh, Justice Klein correctly uh, was critical of the California Supreme Court, which uh, I think says, and maybe the statutes or the regs say this, in the normal course of events, I mean, parole should be <laughs> normally granted. Uh, but there's so many obstacles. And what he points out is that they don't have lawyers. Right. So, uh, and just like in any other kind of uh, legal predicament, when you have a lawyer, you're more likely to put on a better, a better case and then get a better, a better result. Now, I know you're entitled under Morrissey versus Brewer on parole revocation, but I wonder in terms of parole hearings, some kind of assistance to, to assist the, uh, you know, people seeking uh, parole to, to be able to present a better case. And then finally, I know I said finally last time, uh, there should be some kind of presumption, whether it's 100% or 110%, where parole is granted except in unusual circumstances. So all, all of these things I think would lead to, uh, I guess a, a greater uh, organic way of, uh, or holistic, a way of approaching these uh, parole decisions because in the final analysis I think that you know we're so tied to uh, the potential that a parolee uh, may commit another offense that we err on the side of, of continued confinement uh, as opposed to, to release in, 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 in the so-called uh, public interest, uh, but I, I'm not I'm not convinced that uh, that's really uh, the case. I just should bear I should just mention that when the governor first uh, uh, put me on the commission, that was the, the first thing I mentioned to him. I saw him at an event was that we got to take a look at this parole thing because it's it's just. Uh, uh, it's just a huge obstacle to any kind of uh, reform in our criminal justice justice system. And, and, and I don't think it's one that's based in logic or, or in data. So a lot of things, you know, I think I'm interested in, I think that were raised. Uh, so if we do ever come up with recommendations, I hope that we have, you know, some kind of data, whether it supports what I'm saying or not, but I think it's, it's worthy of being explored. I, I share a lot of your concerns. Uh, Professor Ochin. Um, thank you. I, I don't have too much more to, to add to what Justice Bruno uh, had to say other than uh, I agree. Um, I was particularly struck by the discussion uh, from uh, Professor Tonry about um, just sort of the irrationality of the, in, the system in its entirety in terms of um, parole. Uh, looking at the history that he described, my, under, my, my you know, for my limited, um, you know, exposure to the history of parole, right, parole obviously was designed to bring uh, down prison rates and to give people an opportunity to uh, reintegrate into society with support, and it seems to be utilized, uh, you know, currently in the, in the opposite way to, to, you know, to keep people inside. Um, Especially given some of the the grant rates, I was uh, I brought this up with Miss um, Schaefer 
uh, the grant rates for Proposition 57 um, uh, petitioners. Uh, I'd be interested in learning more about that if uh, the staff is able to obtain more information. I'd also be interested, uh, I think I asked about demographical information about uh, who is granted um, parole, who's denied on, on, on what basis, race, age, uh, gender, and, and others, if we can um, uh, obtain them. Uh, I agree with Jessica Moreno about the concerns about future dangerousness and the way in which race can serve as a proxy for dangerousness that's very clear in the context of you know, sentencing across the board, especially in extreme sentences up to and including the death penalty. Of course, uh, Mike, I know you know uh, your colleague at Stanford, Jennifer Eberhardt's work on blackness as a, as a proxy for dangerousness, particularly folks who have uh, more uh, stereotypical, stereotypically black features being viewed as more dangerous. Uh, so I'd be interested uh, to know uh, how um, implicit bias is functioning in the ways that uh, uh, Professor Eberhardt describes in the way that um, Justice Moreno was describing. I'm very concerned about the use of risk assessment tools. Um, and I know that uh, Ms. Schaefer, you know, reassured the committee that, you know, they've been, that the uh, tools that the, the pro board uses have been validated and they're reviewed frequently, but I'd like to get a little bit more into the weeds uh, with regard to the risk assessment tools that are being utilized by the parole board uh, and the effect that they have on the parole board's judgment regarding the question of future dangerousness. Um, I agree with the notion of presumptive release. I was really in intrigued by Utah system uh, and their rates, their recidivism rates and the support that they give people when they're released. Um, representation, I think legal representation, particularly for folks who for anyone, but especially for folks who actually are not able to come before the board in terms of paper review, I think would be an important thing for us to consider. Um, and then I think those are all of the questions um, that I that sort of came to me that I think we should we should explore. Uh, I obviously repeat, repeated a lot of what Justin Moreno had to say, but I, I think it's important for us to amplify uh, areas where we where we uh, are in alignment. So those are my thoughts. So I, sh I share a lot of those concerns, as I said, some of which we addressed last year, but I think that we need to refocus our attention on this because Justice Marino, just like you said, it was one of your top priorities. I remember buttonholing Senator Skinner in a hotel lobby saying it was a top priority of mine. Just a, a few points of clarification, just wanna make sure before we move on, just legally, just so we're all on the same page. First of all, at ordinary parole hearings, not Prop 57, uh, in may, uh, people in prison do have attorneys at parole hearings. It's just that they don't have a, attorneys at the habeas challenge of a parole denial in court, or they don't have um, okay. automatic. So at parole hearings, they do have attorneys. Uh, number two, the standard isn't any evidence. That's the, uh, that's the habeas standard. The standard that the parole board uses is more of a presumption. I mean, excuse me, more of a preponderance of evidence. I mean, again, it's not clear what they use, but it's not any evidence. The any evidence or some evidence rule is the judicial or appellate review of the, just to, just to make clear. Not that, you know, those are all things that we might wanna consider, but I just wanna make sure that we get the, the law straight there. Um, Senator Skinner. Clarification on the law straight. Yes, the person, in those uh, in those parole hearings that uh, Mike qualified is represented by a lawyer. However, they are assigned a lawyer. The lawyer is uh, there's just a, a panel of them, and they are paid exceedingly low. We raised the rate a few years ago, but I think it's if I remember it's something like seventy an hour, and they're limited to no more than something like five hours that they can uh, spend on that person's case, which means that they really can't fully, neither fully understand the, the person's um, file or get to know the person, which is what would be really necessary to properly prepare that individual and represent them in that parole hearing. And so there are um, a variety of external organizations that have been providing this kind of service on their own to a lot of our incarcerated individuals. And they have a higher 
oh, not 100%, but in many cases, a higher rate of successful parole granting. But there is a lot of resistance on the part of the institution to allow them, those groups, to play that role. So it's, uh, it's complicated. So I, I agree it's complicated. And I, it sounds like we should you know, obviously spend some more time on this. Uh, to just to circle back and actually connect two of the ideas that were just came up, uh, Professor Ochin, there have been, and, and this is something that Justice Marina brought up, there have been some studies, at least Kristen Bell, who's, I, I have to say, one of my former students, uh, has done some studies, I had to, um, about um, bias in a uh, parole hearing context. Uh, Ms. Schaefer has some real reservations about the quality of that research and study, and she alluded to some of that before. She really wants a peer-reviewed analysis, which there haven't been. Um, but one of the conclusions that uh, Professor Bell did reach was that having an outside attorney was a genuine benefit to uh, um, potential par parolees as opposed to the appointed counsel. Again, um, without getting too far in the weeds, it sounds like the consensus is, and I'm gonna move on now, that there, we, we really do need a, to, to dig more into this. And I think in particular, figure out how we can improve upon the recommendations that we made last year, which again, got zero traction in the legislature. So, you know, the, the whole point here is to make recommendations that are gonna, you know, make a difference. And so I wanna try to find things that actually will, will get some um, movement. All right. With, 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 with that assignment to continue to figure out, to think about parole standards and parole process in general. Um, before I move on, Professor Ochin. Yeah, I just wanted to lift up something that I don't think was addressed uh, in our discussion, which was something that Judge uh, Klein mentioned um, uh, in his, his written submissions. I think he, he emphasized it a fair amount during his um, testimony, which is that the parole board should be more concerned about proportionality um, in their review of, um, you know, when they're, re when they're reviewing petitions for uh, parole. And so I just didn't want that to get lost. And I think that's an important point for us to consider. Agree, agree. Thanks. Um, all right, moving on to the next uh, topic that uh, caught my attention at least. Uh, this is uh, Professor Tonry mentioned that uh, in some states, and I'm thinking particularly in New York, there is an appellate, court, appellate courts have the ability to review sentences. Um, there, in California, that really does not exist. For example, in New York, I believe the standard is that the appellate court has a power to reduce sentence in the interest of justice um, for any sentence that it views as uh, overly harsh or excessive. That's essentially the, the, the standard of 1385. Um, it's a wide open discretion. Uh, I know Tom has pra practiced as an appellate lawyer in New York, so I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. But I thought it was a, a, an idea that it, at least interests me. Um, Professor Ochin, I don't know if your hand is still up from before. You have a question about this. Um, so uh, I don't know. Tom, do you want to say anything about this, or does any of the members have any questions about this particular proposal? Again, appellate review of sentences, which is pretty much uh, non existent in California. I, you know, I, I have a lot to say about it, but I'll keep my comments very brief. I, th I think the value of having an appellate court look is they're looking across jurisdictions, they're looking, you know, across judges and different prosecutors offices. So it's another way to inject some uniformity in proportionality and a good safety valve for those times when a sentence really just got out of control. Or um, if there's evidence that, you know, people are being treated differently, just because of the county they're in and, and things like that. Um, it was uh, a good way to sort of inject some of that distance into the process, I think. Justice Mario? Yeah, when you say there's no but appellate review of sentencing, I mean, I think there is, if there's a misapplication of the rules. Oh, you know, but, but they, certainly, they, certainly they, appellate they, review of errors. Errors, but this, yeah. But, but, this is, but this is something different. This is this just is, saying, this is, this as a matter of discretion, this sentence yeah. is too long. Perfectly followed all the rules, perfectly yeah, okay. legal, yeah. but um, basically uh, giving appellate judges 1385 authority to reduce right. sentences okay. in the interest of justice, okay. even if everything is even if everything is followed. Yeah, based on equities or what they think is an excessive sentence, sort of like punitive damages. <laughs> 
I, I, do appellate 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 judges do have authority to do that, correct? To reduce appellate yeah. punitive yeah. even when they haven't heard the evidence or don't have well, their five times or nine times. Yeah, they they can. I mean, they're they're kind of law on the case law on that. So. so, well, in any event, is this something that folks are interested in, and should we find further uh, just research on? Well, I, I I don't think it would ever fly. <laughs> uh, Judge Espinoza? Yeah, I want to second that comment, but okay. um, that, that having been said, I'm not sure that um, it will address disproportionality across jurisdictions because the appellate review, for example, in one district is going to be different than the appellate review in another district. And I think you'll find in some of the geographic locations that there'll be more appellate courts willing to uphold, you know, lengthy sentences, but I don't know. I think it's worth looking into. Okay, well, let's let's look into it. I agree. And, you know, of course, in Los Angeles, the appellate review is just the county of Los Angeles. So there's no cross county, uh, you know, at all review, but it would it, it's a step in that direction. And I don't think it's cer certainly nobody suggests that this is a cure all, but it's just another, you know, another tool in the box, perhaps. All right. The next uh, issue that seemed to raise a uh, topic conversation was an issue that was raised by Professor Pfaff um, about find, trying to um, incentivize um, prosecutors and probably judges as well to um, find alternatives to incarceration or reduce sentences generally by providing financial incentives to those counties, um, no mandates, but just a financial incentive that if you were to reduce the number of years, for example, of sentencing on an average or statewide average, that your county would receive a financial incentive. I will say that this has come up a couple times in California. So there was great success, I think, or there were some, let's say, I'll temper that a little bit. There was some success with um, reducing probation uh, violations with financial incentives, um, also with sentencing juveniles to DJJ, with, by putting financial burdens, you know, in one case it was rewarding uh, agency and the other was punishing agent, uh, county agencies, but, uh, but financial incentives in general. And I will say that there was a bill, um, SB 142 a couple of years ago, 2017, that was an attempt to do this with regard to folks, um, sentences for people who uh, had mental illness, but it, it did not pass. Anyway, I was wondering if there's interest in this financial incentive uh, approach to encouraging policies um, on the county level. Uh, yes, yes, I, 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 I do though take uh, what Professor Pfaff said, um, you know, some of his, you know, hesitancy. I think that it's important for us to take that into uh, account, but um, I think some of his suggestions for, for us to think about the front end uh, of the process and creating incentives for counties or prosecutors or other, um, you know, criminal legal actors uh, to exercise discretion in ways that are more rational, um, I, I think are, are good things for us to explore. Other thoughts? I mean, I, I think it's a little bit, I'm interested in it as well. I do think it's, it's curious um, that, um, for example, an agency that is responsible for public safety might be responsive to financial incentives to the, to their county. But like I said, you know, there's been dramatic evidence that that's true, you know, in California, at least in different contexts. And, um, I don't know which way that cuts. Um, but I think it is at least an interesting tool that perhaps we should explore some more and some history. Uh, Judge Espinoza. Now, the only thing I would add to that is when you create a system of financial incentives, those incentives need to be shared with the court, the independent third branch of government, who isn't normally concerned about county budgetary issues, right? Um, so. Sure, I, I totally agree. And that leads me actually is maybe a good segue to um, the last issue that I think came up in the first panel as an idea which was an, another one of Professor Pfaff's that he said he thought was effective, I forget from which state, about um, reporting requirements to judges about the, I think the financial costs of incarceration. 
Um, I, my understanding is that there is a bill currently pending in the legislature, AB 1474, uh, about this uh, to require judges to be um, informed of the financial cost of somebody's incarceration. Again, I have mixed feelings about this because I don't think judges should really be concerned with, you know, the financial cost of incarceration. At the same time, you know, it's it's a reality that people think about. I've been in court where judges have talked about it. Um, so I was wondering if that resonated with anybody. I, I would be interested in hearing from uh, the, the judges uh, on the panel as to whether that information would um, be uh, sort of downloaded um, and, and would it um, cause them to think, would, would, would you think about that information when sentencing someone, for example? Um, I, yeah, I guess I'd just be interested to know before we ask our staff to go down this, this road, if that is information that you would even look to, would you consider it relevant? Would you think it's inappropriate? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I, I would say that I knew the, the figures. I mean, an often expressed uh, statement, you know, a judge would say it costs $70,000 to send someone to Harvard and it costs something close to that to send someone to prison. But I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that at least I, and I would think most of my colleagues, it wouldn't, it wouldn't factor into uh, the length of a sentence or what they would be doing in terms of uh, alternative sentence or something else. I mean, it, I may yeah. be wrong, but it's not something that would be front of mind anyway. I, I would agree. I don't think that judges as the population are generally concerned with budgets. They assume they've been given a job to do and somebody's gonna pay for them to do it. Yeah. Um, and so they may not be as moved by that, but from, a, from the perspective of a citizen, Right, whose taxes go to support these various endeavors, they may be moved somewhat, but I doubt that. It, I agree with Justice Moreno; it's not likely to impact a lot of sentences. You know, I raised this issue yesterday with Doug Bond. I asked him to compare the cost of his caring for someone to the cost of caring for someone in prison. I didn't really. I, that was a question intended for policymakers um, who really. And I, and I raise this issue a lot in Los Angeles, where the disparity between our care and the care in the LA County Jail is even higher than state prison, um, as a way of getting policymakers to really start thinking about realigning um, the way resources are, are, are used to support the criminal justice system. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how much individual judges and their sentencing habits um, will be affected by knowing that they're going to be spending more money to send someone to prison. Yeah. Professor Ochin? Yeah, I mean, I, the thing that I was thinking about uh, when I clerked, um, uh, the judges were concerned about being on certain kinds of lists, like uh, if they had outstanding opinions, you know, they did not want to be on that list, right? right. So right. like a week before that list was to come out, right? We were scrambling to, to get opinions out um, and published yeah. if they were gonna be published. So, you know, I, I, I wonder about that kind of like the public information, would that uh, shape how judges think about their work? I am also thinking about Ferguson and the information that came out about the fees and fines that were being levied by right. courts yeah. um, and how that did shape, you know, shifts in public policy. So I think, having more uh, granular level information about particular, um, you know, appellate districts or superior courts. I don't know if that goes to the chief judges, um, uh, but certainly if it was publicly available, I think, I think the, I, I agree. I think that the, with, with Judge Espinosa, I think that would be important for the public to know, especially as we think about elections, right? Judges do, keep an eye on, you know, I, we talk about judges, you know, not wanting to release someone um, and have that kind of blow back on them because of the consequences of elections. I wonder if this kind of information, even if it doesn't shape their thinking on a particular sentence, would it be something they kept in mind if that was publicly available around an election? Um, and so I, that's a question. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just don't think it would uh, it wouldn't impact the judge's decision. Uh, I think the thing you're talking about 
uh, is uh, aging and inventory. Judges are concerned about that. Uh, they're concerned about uh, circulating within the court. You know, how many trials did that judge do? How many cases do they have on their docket? Are they slow? Are they fast? I mean, I think judges, you know, do do feel uh, or sense peer pressure of that sort with one another. But in terms of how much, you know, if their sentences are are, are costing X amount, I just don't think that 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 would have any any impact. And I really question whether or not the public would would care, but I may be wrong about that, but I don't think the judges would care. I, I, may, mis I may have misunderstood Professor Ochin's point, but what, what if there was public um, documentation about the sentence lengths that each of the judges have imposed as an, as an average? Do you think that that is- uh, so that, That's gonna be, uh, that would just be used in a campaign to challenge a judge, you know, next time, time around that he's a light, it already happened, light sentence or soft on crime. Uh, and the ones who give heavier sentences are gonna be retained or, or you know, voted in. <laughs> so that would be, that would be terrible, toxic. Judge Espinosa, do you have a thought on this? Well, I just, I'm, I'm sitting here shaking my head in concurrence with <laughs> Justice Moreno. I, it'll be a, an incredibly unpopular concept yeah. with the bench. Let me just start yeah. by saying that. Um, and, and judges are um, proud of their status as independent constitutional officers from the third branch who should not be subject to political pressure or um, public opinion necessarily, but should be making their decisions based on the law and the facts. So I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable heading in that direction. And I'll say it won't get a lot of support yeah. within, the, within the judicial community. Professor Ochin. And this is just a, 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 a genuine question. Uh, to what extent are judges um, uh, aware of the trends in their own sentencing? Um, so in other words, uh, is there a yearly report is there, you know, so I can, I mean, there, you know, they, they, there's a huge volume, right? Sure. And so I imagine, right, did judges get a sense of like on this for a robbery, this is the yeah. general range, right? This was the outlier and so, and so well, forth. Is that the, the culture, kind of that kind of information? Yeah, the culture, what you're talking about are legal cultures and they vary from courthouse to courthouse in a county right. as large as Los Angeles County. Um, they, they vary greatly in some instances. Yeah. I will tell you that there is a regular list that's given to judges every month as part of the judges uh, monthly meeting. All of their information is in a packet with everyone else's information. So as you're yeah. sitting in this meeting, looking at your inventory, the rate at which you are resolving cases, um, everyone is looking at everyone else's data. Right. Yeah. However, my, I don't believe there is um, any data collected regarding outcomes, right? right. So, so many went to state prison, so many put on probation. Yeah. I don't believe those are that data is collected on per individual judges. I might be wrong. Um, I don't remember seeing data like that. Yeah, but, but it's something that, you know, defense lawyers and maybe even prosecutors would know. It's like Peter said, it's part of the, the local uh, legal culture about which judges are tougher, which districts uh, are tougher, and you don't want to, you know, have your client convicted in those before that judge or that uh, in that district, but that's not, it, it's just sort of a word of mouth basically. Right. Uh, and, and it's that's just the way it is. And in terms of, you know, the statistics that are shared are the stuff like uh, inventory, cases pending, cases over 180 days, et cetera, with speedy trial kind of concerns. And the feds do the same thing on the district court. Uh, and it comes out that, hey, you've got, you know, three cases that are over a year old or something like that. And that's the incentive for you to put some attention to that case. And, and do judges, I mean, I guess I'm wondering, would that information be helpful if we're concerned about disparities, right? I mean, at the federal level, you know, certainly that's a, that's part of the, the sentencing guidelines. That's the role of appellate courts. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, within a district, would that be something that would be useful if there was funding for that kind of data collection and sharing with the chief yeah. judge or with members of the bench yeah. in a particular district? Here's my other question. Um, 
the point that uh, Chair Romano was raising about outcomes, right? How much information do judges get about outcomes? So they may think, you know, putting this person in, in jail or prison for X amount of time improves public safety, right? Do they get information about, you know, five year, five year report? on you know people whom they sentenced to prison what are the outcomes are they are they desisting um have they been rearrested I, you know is that i guess I, I, yeah i don't know what kind of information judges get about the efficacy of their um sentencing practices yeah i i, I don't know of any i mean there are you know certain judges uh, who would keep tabs uh informally for years you know, kind of an informal probation. Uh, and they would take a particular interest in an individual, but in terms of anything that's uh, systematic uh, or reported on or data gathered, I don't know of any such thing. There, there is however, no, there is no prisoner, such data. Yeah, and if a prisoner escapes, however, you're told that someone you sentenced escaped. Right, or when so, one of your probationers does something worthy of the front page of the LA Times. Yeah, that's always that's always an interesting experience. So I'm a strong advocate of of, of uh, as much data as possible. I really do think it's it's kind of a shame that judges you know keep in, and and I actually had the same experience, Professor Ocean clerking, and the judges keep such close tabs on you know how many days they've had a case, but the outcomes of the case are completely you know recorded nowhere where those are the people's lives who are putting in prison right versus you know. Judges. So um, I don't know if we have the granularity down to the judge, but I think that some of the data that the data is collect that the that the account that the, excuse me that the committee has is collecting will give us a sort of a market. We'll be able to publish perhaps, um, and we're going to have a presentation later on in the year about the data that we have and the opportunities. But sort of the marketplace of what's the marketplace for robbery and what counties and what uh, might be out of that or. I think that that, that that you know can be helpful, and I've certainly been in situations in front of judges where we um, argue, "Here's the average sentence for this particular crime," and you're in the and you know you're contemplating something much longer. So, yeah, you know, I think. But you know, something else that I wanted to to raise, um, and, and I share the judges' skept. Well, first of all, I believe one state, Minnesota may have this reporting requirement on the financial costs of incarceration. And I think that there has been studies on its efficacy or not and, and, and its impact, even if it's implicit on judges' decisions. So we could have some further staff research on that. But, and I don't even know if this is possible or even appropriate for a legislative fix, but I think judges should be aware of the human cost of incarceration and um, see you know, what jails are, and prisons are like um, somehow somehow get that if they're going to send somebody that they should really understand what they're sentencing them to and just a number of months or years on a piece of paper um or even the dollar sign just seems very an abstract um well i know, and, and, I know and antiseptic excuse me sorry uh way of evaluating what the appropriate punishment should be and I don't know how to how to correct that, but we sit in our courtrooms and everything is so sterile, and people don't have a appreciation of what you're actually sentencing this human being to. I don't know how to fix that, but it's something that I raise. Uh, judge Espinoza, I'm well, just going to say, in the old days at Judges College, we all used to go up right. to St. Quentin, yeah, We'd go out St. Quentin, see the death chamber, see a cell block. Um, I don't know how to. I don't know how to characterize what impact that might have had on other judges. I'd already been in enough lockups visiting clients and um, to not have been overwhelmed by that. But it was a, a stark experience to see the death chamber and to see and to see what prison looks like. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's give that some more thought. Uh, I'm going to move on here, unless anybody has to our to our next. It wasn't quite panel, but to uh, Jennifer Schaefer's discussion of Prop 57 parole. Does anybody have anything to add from the first panel of things for further research by the by this by staff? All right, hearing none, I'm going to move on. So uh, Jennifer Schaefer came to give a presentation about Prop 57 parole. Just to refresh everybody's memory, this is not. Um, ordinary life or parole, indeterminate sentencing parole, and as we currently, as we 
mostly understand parole. This is a parole opportunity for currently, uh, and this is in the constitution, limited to people in prison who have committed nonviolent offenses. They have a parole, they have an opportunity for what's called a paper review, so not a full hearing, um, for uh, potential early release by the parole board before any enhancements are to um, kick in. And um, so a couple of ideas came up as part of that conversation. I'm just gonna bullet point a couple of them and then uh, I'd love to hear what other people have thought. Um, first of all, there was the idea about expanding that to, to more people, to not just the nonviolent uh, folks in, in prison, but expanding the eligibility of, of who might be considered for early parole. Um, there were some questions about the paper review process. Is that appropriate? Again, there's no legal counsel for that. That's what we were talking about. There's, there's no legal counsel for the paper review process. Should there be full-blown parole hearings? Obviously, more due process is more due process, but it's also uh, time and financially uh, consuming. And this is a large group of people. Um, there's, a, there's a question that was raised in the staff memos that unlike ordinary parole, um, credits do not apply in calculating when somebody gets to the Prop 57 parole process. So the ordinary parole process, if you're given 25 to life, but you get, let's say 15% off of your sentence as a matter of, um, of um, credits based on good time, then you might get to the parole board after 22 years. I don't know if that math checks out exactly, mm -hmm. but, that, but that does not apply in the Prop 57 context. So in other words, it's the actual date um, of your first parole hearing, not including credits. So that's another thing to think about. Um, and then something that raised, raised, oh, two other things that were raised. Um, in the memo, there was a question about, um, well, if you have a nonviolent offense and sentenced to prison, you get a chance at early parole, but what about jail? Why do, you know, there are, there has been an historic uh, role for parole in the jail context, but it's currently, as far as I know, not used at all anywhere. And then the last thing that we talked about a bit was um, the opportunity, and this, this will, we could tag on perhaps to our final, to the final panel, was an opportunity to send people or to give the parole board authority to send people to a halfway house or MCRP as opposed to just the binary decision of in prison, remain in prison until we hear from you further, uh, or out on the street, 100% out on the street and giving some sort of intermediate re you know, release option. So those were the, the bullet points that I, that I heard and, and came to mind. I was wondering if other people had thoughts, questions a bit, again, let's to the Prop 57 as opposed to our earlier conversation about uh, the life or parole, which we'll call that. And the only other thing I would just reiterate is the statistics. To get more data, to collect more data. Yeah, or yeah. particularly demographic um, data. Uh, but everything else, I think, uh, and I don't think we talked much about the jail issue um, in terms of the panel. Uh, so I'd be, um, uh, you know, very interested in, in talking about that, especially as we think about, you know, LA County um, and uh, the challenges that we're having with populations. And uh, yeah, so I, in other words, yes, I think we should look at that issue. Tom, can you just refresh people's memory and, and refresh my own actually about the history of parole in the jail context or maybe yeah, parole isn't even the right word? Well, I think it is. Um, there's, and it still exists in the penal code, this concept called county parole, which would be a lot like, you know, the life of parole we've talked about. And it was someone from the sheriff's office, probation department, and a citizen who gets appointed, and they would have the power to set up a parole system and set their own rules and eligibility and everything like that. Um, when we looked into this last year, I could only find that Kern County was using it at all. And of course, this exists alongside other early release, work release, and electronic monitoring um, as well. But it doesn't look like it's used really anywhere in the state, but it's sort of lying in the in the penal code is something that that there's a structure that exists for it now. And just just and a I, sorry, just a clarification question. Does and does that only apply to and I'm assuming it, it only applies to felony convictions? I don't 
think it's necessarily written in that way. I'd have to check, but I think it's just anyone who's, you know, in, in county jail custody would, would have the option for it. I, I think the reality is that most people serving misdemeanor sentences are in the bigger counties are, are not held there for very long, particularly in LA because of overcrowding. I know Judge Espinoza could tell us about that, but I, I think it would technically apply. And, and, I, and I think this on this topic, the jail versus prison sentence, there are people who get uh, convicted of the same offense, who go in the same nonviolent offense and go to prison because they have a prior strike and they have an opportunity for early release that they may not have, um, that they would have in jail. So there's just, it's not necessarily a rational system. And that's why I think it's important too, is you people who are um, just their place of incarceration gives them less legal opportunities for release. I, you may have addressed this and I didn't hear you, but could county parole be used for persons in the jail serving AB 109 realignment sentences? Absolutely. That would be, the, I think, the core population for it. Wow. That's an interesting it's... thing to look at because there are people serving unbelievable AB 109 sentences in our county. Yeah. 12 years in the LA County Jail, you know, I mean. And, and I guess also my question is, how does that interact with probation? Because I know that um, some of that supervision has been sh for AB 109 folks. I don't know if it extends to folks who are serving those kinds of sentences, but probation is also involved. So uh, yeah, I guess I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how these different uh, systems inter interact. I, I, county parole pre-exist the time when probation did a lot of PRCS, the post-release community supervision. So I think that the law just isn't, there's just it's areas where laws just don't connect in ways that they would if we were starting today. But I, I think part of the power the county parole board has is to create up that system of supervision. I assume it would be done through a local probation department, but I think it's because no one uses it. It's just, it's a hypothetical at this point. I agree that this is a really interesting area, yeah. given that it's already existing in statute, it'd be we'd have to think hard about how do we how do we lift it up and how do we I mean maybe it's just a question of funding but how do how do we encourage the counties to use it right they already have this power but nobody's using it so uh, you know what we can do i think is this question the advantage of course over uh, meddling with prop 57 is that it's not written into the constitution right we could a statutory change or even a regulatory change or i guess it even doesn't even need a statutory change because it's already in the but my point is prop 57 parole is written written into the california constitution so it's a little bit harder to to amend versus the county uh, parole but it sounds like you know further let's do some further research there i just wanted to circle back though despite the difficulty with the, the the practicality of amending the California Constitution. One of the reasons why I think Prop 57 parole is interesting and could be further um, explored and perhaps expanded is because it's another way to look at enhancements, right? It, it gives up people an opportunity for a release prior to serving any part of their enhancement. And we've heard so much about the problem of enhancements. So the way the Prop 57 parole works again is you for, serve your base term, which might be three or five years, and you might have a 30 year enhancement on top of that, but you get a review at five years and you get a review annually. Um, and it just seems like that we limit it to nonviolent people. I understand for political purposes, that's makes sense. But another thing that we heard yesterday was that that's a political distinction. That's not necessarily a public safety distinction. Yes, Senator Skinner. Well, also, the initiative did not put that strict limitation. The regs, the regulations that CDCR adopted put that strict limitation. So, you know, it's harder to make, potentially to get the public to, or even the legislature to maybe change those kind of things. But that's something the, it's a regulatory, it was a regulatory decision. What's a whole other thing that we should perhaps consider? I mean, our mandate as a committee is penal code. However, a lot of the things that we're discussing, include, especially around parole, are written in regulation. Yes. Yes. And yes. obviously statutes can trump regulations, but they're, they're also harder to enact. And I don't know what our role as a committee, should we be you know, encouraging the administration or others to 
in the regulatory process or should we really stick to the code well, itself? We should look at the regulatory process because for example, I can, uh, I won't write this instant, but I could easily provide you a number of bills that were vetoed because governors, um, including the current governor, did not want to put something into statute that could be governed by regulation. And so in other words, had the flexibility to be able to be changed and such. However, as most of the ones I have tracked, they've never changed the regulation. Well, I, think, I think that that's particularly an area of interest. Um, and, and sort of, a, I, I guess I raised this kind of a procedural question we don't need to address at this point as to whether or not this committee wants to wade into regulations as opposed to mere statutes. Um, obviously, this, the regulations that we would be discussing are governed by penal code statutes. So I think there's a, at least a, a theory that they um, are within our jurisdiction, but uh, I just wanted to consider that. In any event, it seems like there's an interest in trying to find ways to expand what we'll call Prop 57 parole or parole for Determ other determinately sentenced people. I don't know another way of putting it or parole before enhancements kick in, um, whether it be uh, in jail or prison. Um, I think we're gonna have to be creative here, um, but I'm gonna say that let's try to, you know, explore some avenues that, that prop for, I'm gonna use a shorthand that this, this Prop 57 parole process might be able to be expanded. All right, um, we have two more panels to discuss, but I wanna take a short break. So let's take a 10 minute break. I have, um, um, why don't we reconvene, a little bit less than 10 minutes, but just to make it even, let's reconvene at 2.15. Um, so that's like eight minutes uh, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>